Welcome to Spotlight on the Arts. <laughs> I'm, I'm Iris Acker and I'm your host tonight. Our topic today is the Florida Grand Opera. <laughs> Let's meet our panel before we meet our guest. First up, Bill Hirschman, who is a theater arts journalist. And Michelle Solomon, who is the theater critic for Florida Theater onstage.com, and we have the pleasure and privilege of having Dan Clancy, playwright. Dan is understudying Michael McKeever, who mm. couldn't be here today, and Michelle for Karen Stevens. Our guest, Brian Kello, public relations manager for Florida Grand Opera, in charge of letting the world know about what's going on at Florida Grand Opera. Now really, what do you do, Brian? You make that, you make that sound so daunting. <laughs> uh, well, it is my job. I just came to Miami from New York in early January. January 4th, I got on the plane and came down here after 34 years in New York, where I was the features editor of Opera News magazine. For oh. many, many years. And uh, so uh, I relocated to Miami, and uh, I am responsible for writing all the press releases for the opera company, for getting the word about, out about all the productions, and uh, making sure that we get lots of stories from our local journalists <laughs> and reviews <laughs> from our local journalists, <laughs> which is very, very important, of course, to, to building our audience. And uh, I love. Um, it's interesting because after so many years on the other side of the editorial equation, as an editor and a journalist, uh, uh, it's fascinating to work on this side of it. And I really like it a lot, I have to say. It's, it's an entirely different kind of challenge. So, um, is it, it must be a challenge. You know, I've heard so many people say that opera is a dying art. No, 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 no. not at all. Um, I can tell you, I have a very good reason for saying no. Oh, okay. Um, just the other night, I was at an absolutely amazing performance of the Florida Grand Opera's Ballo and Mascara by Verdi with an astonishing cast that I think you would be happy to see in New York or London or anywhere. And the audience was on fire. They were just, it was one long ovation after another, so there's no way that it's dead. Um, I think what is difficult is, is uh, dealing with the attention span of the audience sometimes. Oh. Uh, I, I wanted to, I'll, I'll just do a little rant. <laughs> rant <away. laughs> uh, there, in, in Balo and Mascara, there is a f fairly long first scene and then another second scene in the first act. But there's a very short pause between those two scenes. And it's amazing how many people cannot wait till the intermission at the end of the first act to start texting. <gasps> they do it oh, at this God, very hurts. brief pause between the two scenes in the first act. And I don't understand why they can't concentrate. They, they can't shut out the world. Well, it's the young people, though, because... For half an hour longer. But on a positive note on that, I know that I've talked to Susan Danis, and you guys have been considering, or maybe you've done it and I've been part of it, to have people, or you've built it into some programming where maybe you're sub to get the word out on social media. Oh, yeah. To maybe, so it's, I think it's when she does her talk that you tell people text your friends or, or do social media. Yeah, so we do. I think that's an, I mean, you don't want it during the performance, but I think right. that you've, tell me a little bit, tell us about, because that's that was interesting to me. I was at something and you were promoting that right, to go exactly. on your phones and. Right, well, a lot of theater companies and, and opera companies are doing this now. I mean, they actually, the, the I think it's the Guthrie in, in Minneapolis actually has a section where you can text all during the performance, which I don't agree with. No. But, um, but no, we do, we do want to get that word out. And social media for Florida Grand Opera has become a huge thing, as I think it is for lots of opera companies, most. She mentioned Susan Danis, so I yeah. think you should explain who she oh, is. Yes. Susan you. Danis is the uh, CEO and general director of Florida Grand Opera. She is just concluding her fourth season with the company. 
-hmm. and she is a real breath of fresh air. <laughs> it's a pleasure to work for her. Uh, she's really the reason I came down here mm. because of her reputation. Wow. And uh, one of the things that she has done that has been very, very good is she has introduced one contemporary opera into the mix every season. We do four operas every year. Mm -hmm. And one is a modern work and usually one that has some connection to the community. Um, it's called Made in Miami, the series that she has devised. So this year it was Jorge Martin's Before Night Falls, which is about uh, the wonderful uh, author, Reynaldo Arenas, uh, who came over and the, the Marielle boat left in 1980. And that, of course, appealed to the Cuban community in Miami because it was so much about their history. Mm. Next year, it's going to be Daniel Catan's beautiful opera, Florencia on el Amazonas. Uh, and it's a gorgeous piece. It's like Puccini on steroids, you know. Uh, well, so. you're completing your 75th. Yep. Season, yep, can you imagine? Absolutely. 70, I think 1941, what did I read about? Yeah. Uh, that's when. That's when it started. Yes, that, uh, that's amazing. Yeah. I think it's one and of the oldest are. arts organizations, is it in the state, one it, of the, the oldest? The oldest, it's continuously the oldest running continuous. performing arts organization yeah. in, in the state of Florida. Yes. Yeah. Well, the venues where you are now. In, in your profession, um, my whole life, I had all these tentacles. I was a teacher, I was an actor, <laughs> um, and these tentacles were sort of separating, and then somehow they all became part of an octopus. What were the <laughs> tentacles that, in your life that sort of led you to your new position? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, well, I studied as, I grew up on the West Coast. Uh, I grew up in Oregon, and I studied music quite seriously. I never wanted to be a performer because I wasn't good enough, frankly. Yes. Um, but I was a pianist and I sang a little bit. And uh, then when I came to New York right after I graduated from college, uh, I had no money. <laughs> Big surprise. And I had a job in book publishing, so I really wasn't making any money. <laughs> and, uh, uh, my roommate and good friend, Cynthia Peterson, was the house manager at the Metropolitan Opera. Mm. And so I could go to the Met for mm. free, night after night after night after night, and hear people like Joan Sutherland and Luciana Pavarotti mm -hmm. and Placido Domingo and Nikolai Guetta, uh, great, great singers. And uh, it was started out as a means of free entertainment, and it became a passion for me. I think I'd seen one opera before I came to New York. Well, I'd say <laughs> what I like is that you do have a young look audience now. Yeah. I mean, I say in addition to the, and um, it pleases me so much to look around. They may be the ones texting, but, <laughs> yeah. but they are there. And uh, you have a uh, young artist company. Right. I mean, the young artists, like, are they considered like, um, what would you, apprentices? Right. Yeah, I mean, so that's the correct. Yeah. Right. They, but they, they get real roles. I mean, I oh, yes. talk um, a little about that. Well, talk yeah. about the program. We have Eight, is it eight, I think, uh, or ten young artists in our current program. And they're varied and they're different and they are all very, very talented. And what happens is they get, they get coaching, they get training, they mm -hmm. get to uh, advance their learning about their craft, uh, but also they get to be on stage. And they get to play small roles mm -hmm. in the main stage productions. Um, one of our artists, Calvin Griffin, who's very talented, bass baritone, uh, you'll be hearing a lot more from him, I think, in the future. Uh, he was in all four main stage mm -hmm. productions this year. He's very, very good. His big part was Victor, uh, Arenas' tormentor in Before Night Falls, and he was oh, wonderful. Yes. He was wonderful. Saw that, wonderful. Are they homegrown? Are, are the young artists always from, I know I've interviewed a few mm -hmm. that are from the local area, um, Some of them are, yeah, but we get them from all over. And, oh, it, yeah. and is it through yeah. an audition process? How mm -hmm. do they end up? They audition. Your... They okay. audition, and then we, uh, the company provides housing for them, mm. and so it's a great chance for them. And they're usually here for two years. And uh, Elena Galvan, who's Oscar in a masked ball, uh, is another young artist, and it's a wonderful part for her. And you know, it's launching her career. I mean, people will, will know about her now, and I, 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 if, if they're smart, they'll hire her. <laughs> <laughs> and I was saying, there's so few outlets now, we, very few newspapers mm -hmm. that have critics. Yes. And so, yes. so, but you did mention that radio, TV, have they been 
helpful. <laughs> I, well, I've had a very happy start to this job. I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> but, uh, I, had, uh, I came here three weeks before opening night of Eugene Onegin. So I really hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. um, and I did fine with that, um, thanks to places like Miami Art Scene. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, Before Night Falls got an extraordinary amount of press because of its subject matter and the fact that it was just a natural fit, I think. I mean, the Cuban community here, and, uh, and I had a wonderful, uh, I had a publicist dream hook. Elizabeth Caballero, who was in the cast of Before Night Falls, came over as a child on the Mariel boat lift in 1980. Wow. I had a story. I, I, several television stations wow. picked that mm -hmm. up. You know? mm -hmm. yeah, it was a great story. It really was. She remembers it vividly, you know. How does, how, you talk about, um, we were talking about how the opera is not dead now that we're in our 75th season. Right. How do you build, though, the next generation, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with the fact that tickets are not especially cheap, um, at least not the ones the critics you, get to you, sit in? Oh, you can <laughs> get uh, very inexpensive tickets. You can right. get tickets for $13, yeah. but you're sitting up right. in the in the. So leather. how do you build the next generation, or how are you trying to build the next generation of opera goers. We have a lot of outreach. We have an extraordinary outreach program, and uh, we have a, a remarkable woman named Rebecca Diaz Vandre, who is the director of education and community engagement, and mm -hmm. she works tirelessly with the schools, with the community. She's very inventive. She is very imaginative and very personable. She's a, a, a singer herself, and. Uh, it, we have a huge amount of, of activity like that. We just did a, a wonderful event in the a band shell concert um, over at Miami Beach, uh, which was packed. It was on a balmy Sunday evening, and they did an abridged version of Carmen oh. and for the kids. You Perfect. Know, so they, they don't have to sit through all three hours of it. They can, they can just see the high points. And, but you bring the opera uh, to the schools, cool. too, don't yes, you? Yes, we yes, take them that's to the what schools. I think is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, think Absolutely. You're an interesting company um, because we get to see you in Miami. Right. And then, luckily, the Broward, the Broward County folks don't have to go far. So you're, yeah. not, you're not telling people to drive to Miami. You're also at the Broward Center in Fort Lauderdale. Absolutely. Um, how is that for audiences? You know, like you're, you're, seeing, you're seeing the same show in Miami and mm -hmm. Fort Lauderdale, but you're able to reach. That's much more of a massive reach than a lot of companies can do that are based just in one city. Oh, yeah, city. it is. It is. And the, the Broward is slightly larger than the Arsht, where we perform in Miami. Mm. Um, so it's, it's, it's a challenge to fill all those seats. Mm. It really is. But, uh, but we love being able to, to branch out a little bit and you know, to a, a, another part of the community. The, the, uh, the company itself, do you have like a permanent chorus, permanent orchestra, or they pick up? Um, it's, we don't have our own orchestra. Uh, we, uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's assembled each time. But there are great advantages to that, actually. You know, you can, you can get the best of whoever happens to be available at any given time. I mean, when I lived in New York, I worked for a chamber orchestra for a while. And it was a union chamber orchestra. And it could be very difficult if you had a problem mm. with personnel. It, you know, it, it was very difficult to deal with it sometimes. Uh, so, um, but we, I think it's a terrific, terrific band that mm. we've got. But and, you've got uh, a resonant conductor in Ramon Tabar. Ramon Tabar mm. is the principal conductor, absolutely. Right. absolutely. He's, he's, a, he's a, a through line yeah. for us, yeah. Do you um, find that the audiences do tire, uh, I think, Bill uses the expression, the war horses, yeah. you know, like the Carmens and the Aedes and that. Uh, or still, I mean, do they crave them or they resent them now? What, is, what, what, is, what do you find? Different parts of the audience react differently. Mm -hmm. um, there are people in the audience, I think, who aren't going to come to something unless they recognize the title. And I think that's too bad. You know, because they're missing some fantastic stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but then there is the part of the audience that probably doesn't want to go see Aida for the umpteenth time and yeah. is curious about something like Before Night Falls. <clears throat> and so I think you're, you, you have to figure out how to target those different uh, components of the audience, you know. But, you're, but visually, um, frequently the, uh, the production, the director, 
will find a completely new approach to it. You'll get a feeling like, mm -hmm. yes, the notes are the same, but they're coming at it from a slightly different place. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I can see we're coming back to that. I mean, it's like watching Shakespeare, and yeah, each well. director brings something different, and each company brings something different to it, even if you've heard it before. I've only been reviewing opera now about six years, and my experience prior to that is very limited, but obviously it's very extensive as far as musical theater. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I thought is interesting, and I wonder if you could address it, is the expectations for people who are coming to opera for the first time, where there are conventions that are perfectly normal for the last 200 years, but that <laughs> are very specific to opera. For instance, repeating a line over and over and over right. and over, <laughs> right. or right. Take, dramatically taking something. Um, it takes a long time to dramatic narratively get from one point to another. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in, mm -hmm. in the ADD culture of film audiences, they go, I got that, you wanna move on to the next point. Right. So how do, you, how do you deal with first timers or people who are trying to come to opera? What should they expect? Well, I think we, we, we do try to really put out as much of an advanced educational initiative as we can. A lot of community events, as I was saying. A lot of, if it's something especially that is extremely unfamiliar to them. We try to help them prepare as well as they can. Mm -hmm. Now, when I first started going to the opera, I sat down and read every libretto front mm -hmm. to back because right. I wanted to know exactly what was going on. I don't think it's reasonable to think today with as complicated as people's lives are that they're going to do that. They aren't, we all know they're not going to do that. So um, I think we, we try to make the storytelling on stage as clear as possible as we can. I think there's a lot of attention given to that. Um, and and you, people do ask a lot of questions at intermission. I mean, they see me wearing my badge, you know, and, they come, and I'm wandering around in the lobby. And uh, they will say, uh, could I ask you a question? There's something here I don't understand. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so, you know, and you answer their questions as, as well but as you can. But they should be encouraged. Everybody, again, Justin Moss. I was I mean, going to say. It's yeah. like, you know, I, I, it's the best part of the opera sometimes <laughs> is, his, is his talk before. <laughs> Just and I don't explain really what that is. Yeah, that I want to think we really talk yeah. back. Yeah. Those are so good. Yeah, we have an extraordinary guy on the staff, Justin Moss, who's been with the company <laughs> for a long, long time. And he is a walking encyclopedia of if. opera knowledge. And he is a very erudite, sophisticated, charming guy. And he does a, a, a talk one hour before each show. And the audiences love it. Which I mean, everyone uh, should do. Yeah. Absolutely. Because it's just, it, for me, it just creates the event. You know, you're yes. starting, and then you're kind of getting ready. And then, you know, your show starts, and you have all this knowledge. Yeah. Um, and, and he, he is. He's but just, he tells he's, the plot. He, he's like a storyteller mm -hmm. himself. That's right. Yes. He gives you the plot so right. that even if you don't know the show, you are... You understand what you're about to see. And in addition, he also sets the cultural and historical sense of it so that you know where this felt, where, where, this, where this opera f fell in, in a composer's development. He can tell you the social background mm -hmm. of it. It makes all the difference. It can't. Oh, and for yeah. viewers, that's incredible. a, we're going to tell viewers, that's a value added. I mean, you don't, you go that's early right. and you, that's, that's right. part of your ticket. Yeah. And, and What's it's the reaction just a wonderful of the schools? Experience. When you bring the opera to the youngsters, I am really glad you asked. Me. Okay, <laughs> because I have an answer. <laughs> uh, the first time that I went to a, a, a school dress rehearsal, uh, we we have one, uh, usually two dress rehearsals because we have two casts. Um, and for Eugene Onegin earlier this year, uh, the first dress rehearsal I attended was was uh, full of high school students from the high school. Area. Okay. And I'm going to be honest, I walked in and I thought, oh my God, this is, this is going to be a long night. Uh, because, you know, they're going to talk, they're going to text, they're going to be... No, I was dead wrong. They watched it with rapt attention. Wow. And it was really touching 
Because at the end of Eugene Onegin, when Tatiana tells Onegin, I will not leave my husband, it's too late. Our, our romance is over, and it, you missed the opportunity to have me. The entire theater of these kids said, yes! <laughs> yes! Oh. You know, and they were clapping and cheering and whistling. Oh. And it was this visceral reaction, yes. you know. And, and then when, at the end, when Onegin finally has his meltdown and realizes yeah. that he has completely messed up his entire hope of a life with her, they, they did it again. They were, they were, it was fantastic. It was like, it, was, it reminded me of what it must have been like seeing opera in Italy in the 19th century. You know? I mean, it was really, really something. When, when I was a teacher in New York and I used to bring my students to every possible free theater or, or ballet, mm -hmm. and you'd walk in and the audiences would give you these incredible looks like, oh no, here goes. <laughs> but what I found is, is it's all in the preparation. And with, with having um, experts coming into the classroom and preparing the students, um, it, it, was, it, it made it, um, it, made it uh, a wonderful experience for the students. And I, I really believe that, that the students are ready and they want to experience something, but we have to prepare them for it. We, we do, and we have to give them that chance. And I recently uh, did an interview with the conductor, James Conlon, who was here in, in Miami conducting the New World Symphony, of the Shostakovich 12th. And I did an interview with him for my blog, uh, followkello.com. Did you see how adroitly I got that in? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to repeat it. <laughs> right. uh, and he said something that's really stayed with me. He said, look, all performing arts organizations have a huge challenge now to fill the seats, to mm -hmm. get the audiences in there, to get the young audiences in. He said, because... The educational system has failed us. Arts education is not being taught mm -hmm. in the schools on the level that it, it used to be, mm -hmm. certainly, or needs to be. And so uh, he said, the institutions did not create this problem, but we have to, we have to find a solution mm -hmm. for it. And I think that's what, what everybody feels right now, you know. Oh, theater, so I, um, yeah. I it's mean, true. I had a wonderful arts education. I did, did all of I, you? I did. It saved my life. I right. Mean, you know, I, yeah. Right. Arts and, you know, I, I grew up in a smaller town. And I had arts, and that was what my life was. I mean, I didn't go out and hang out because <laughs> I had to be up in the morning, you know, at 7 o'clock to play in the marching band. Right. <laughs> so right. I didn't right. want to be out, yeah. you know, with the kids hanging on the street corner. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Brian, well, if... Um, if people are watching out there and say, you know, I, I might like to to work in this in this particular field, uh, <laughs> nonprofit. What what advice would you give them? <laughs> are you talking about uh, oh. being an opera singer or being a in, in a nonprofit um, public <laughs> How long relations is this program? <laughs> uh, um, Four or more minutes. Uh, okay, well, um, you do it in I think if that is what you want to do and that is your passion, then you do it. You f there are certainly more lucrative professions you could go into, mm -hmm. but I have worked in the arts. I've worked in publishing and music and theater all my life, and I can't think of anything that would have given me more pleasure. I've had a great life, and, and it's not over. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's been a thrill, and I think if you really feel that that's your calling, then that's your calling, you know. Let's give a couple of websites now, as yeah. a matter of fact, um, as far as the opera is concerned, yes. Florida. Yes, absolutely. Florida Grand Opera is www.fgo.org. Uh, you can always get tickets there. Uh, the this, this season, next season, 2017-18, uh, has been announced, uh, and the brochures are out, so you can get tickets there. Um, or you can call 1-800-741-1010. And, and order tickets from the box office. And there are student discounts and senior yep. citizen discounts. <laughs> all kinds of discounts. All this kind Absolutely. of thing. We really have to encourage young people to go everywhere. The theater, the yeah. opera, the ballet. Because it's, we I need think them. We need opera them. is need a them. singular experience. It really is. It's not like anything else. It's, it's the culmination of so many things. Mm -hmm. Drama and music and costumes and the dance. The costumes, even. the sets. Yeah. It's, Always it's, remarkable. Yes. Always. And I, 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 just ha I took somebody to the first opera he'd ever attended the other night, and he was overwhelmed by it. Elliot Rodriguez 
the anchor for CBS, local <gasps> CBS, had never been to an opera. Uh -huh. And he and his wife are hooked now. I got uh -huh. them to come this season. So I do think it's when you're an arts, when you're that passionate arts person, the opera really, and I've explained this to people, it does have it all. It, it is musical mm -hmm. theater. Yeah. It's, you know, it's regular theater. It's dance. It's, it's wonderful, you know, classical music with the orchestra playing. So, right. and I do think once you're in those seats and you're taken by it, there's really nothing better. No. Quickly, how do you feel about the uh, opera on film that is in our local theaters here as well? Is that competition? Well, I'm going to De Rosenkavalier next uh, Saturday, so I'll, I'll, be, I'll be seeing it there. But that's the Metropolitan Opera. Um, <laughs> yes, I think it is competition. I do. I think, uh, I think it's a wonderful idea mm. that the Met and other companies have had to, to show these, these HDs. But I think there are several problems. I don't think it's created a new audience. Yeah. I think it's predominantly an older audience. They're going mm. for $20 or $25. Exactly, yes. And, uh, and I do think it cannibalizes the, 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 the live audience for the local company. But it does, so, it does, I'm sorry, I was just going to very quickly, that it does save those performances for future generations. That's, that's Renee absolutely. Fleming's yeah. last. There are many great things yeah. about it. They I think it's complicated. by the way, of everything. Right. Do you yeah. not? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They do, because I couldn't get them for the show. Yeah, <laughs> we have, we have our But wasn't this delightful? <laughs> it was really. wonderful. Yeah, well, it really was. So, I hope you. we've okay. gotten a few people out there, no, I should say more than a few, but a lot of people out there <laughs> to join us at the opera, really. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a marvel, like you said, a marvelous experience. We've done that with the ballet, too, where if I can't believe that people haven't gone to the ballet. Uh, is it just me? No. no. Anyway, Brian, we thank you <laughs> thank because you. Um, you're certainly getting the word out there, and we encourage you. We'll be right behind you whenever we can. Thank you very much. We'll show this, off, <laughs> this show as often as we can to help you as well. And um, I hope that it's meant something to you so that you will not only go to the opera, but continue to join us here and learn what's going on in South Florida. And if you really want to know what's going on, you go to floridatheateronstage.com. Everything that's happening is right there for you. And everything that's not happening there, it's happening here, I promise you, <laughs> if not now, next week as well. So please continue to join us.